Uh, okay, we are live on YouTube. Um, Norma, you can go ahead and our interpreters can begin translating, please. Wonderful. Muy buenas tardes y bienvenidos a todos segundo de tres ayuntamientos comunitarios de Pilsen de este mes sobre la preservación. Mi nombre es Norma Celedón. Es un placer para mí servir como su moderadora esta tarde. Soy residente actual de la villita de Little Village y he trabajado previamente en Pilsen durante más de 15 años en una agencia llamada Mujeres Latinas en Acción. Sigo sirviendo a la comunidad de varias maneras. Soy bilingüe pero hoy me van a escuchar mayormente en inglés porque tendremos una traductora. Enseguida le daremos instrucciones para conectarse con, ser, con los servicios de traducción. Hello everyone and welcome to this month's second of three pills in community town halls on preservation. My name is Norma Saledon. It's a pleasure to serve as your facilitator this afternoon. I'm a current resident of Little Village and have worked in Pilsen for over 15 years at Mujeres Latinas en Acción in the past. I continue to serve the community in various ways. This is but one of those ways. I am bilingual, but tonight you will hear me speak primarily in English because we have a translator with us. And following, we will let you know how to access the interpreter. So this meeting is being simultaneously translated into Spanish, please dial the conference call line in the chat box to listen to the Spanish translation. For those of you on the phone, here is the number 312-535-8110 and the access code is 375-243-35. You do not need an attendee ID number, simply press the pound or hashtag sign. Esta reunión se está traduciendo simultáneamente al español. Por favor, marque la línea de llamada de conferencia en el cuadro de chat para escuchar la traducción al español. Para aquellos de ustedes en el teléfono, aquí está el número 312-535-8110. Ocho uno uno cero, lo voy a repetir tres doce cinco tres cinco ocho uno uno cero y tendrán que someter el código de acceso tres siete cinco dos cuatro tres tres cinco nuevamente tres siete cinco dos cuatro tres tres cinco. No necesita un número de identificación de asistente, simplemente presione el signo de crucigrama o lo que se le llama en inglés hashtag. This meeting is also being recorded and live streamed on the planning department's YouTube page and a link to the recording and the presentation will be circulated to all registrants later this week. By taking part in the webinar, you are agreeing to the recording. Joining us this afternoon from the Department of Planning and Development are Commissioner uh, Maurice Cox, uh, Commissioner of the Department of Planning and Development, and Gerardo Garcia, Lead Planner for the West Region. Also on the line to answer questions that come up are Eleanor Gorski, the first Deputy Commissioner, and Matt Crawford from the City's Historic Preservation Team. Um, also listening into the call are Tom Tunney, the Chairman of the Zoning Committee, Rafael Leon, the Chairman of the Commission on Chicago Landmarks and other city staff from the Planning Department and the Mayor's Office of Community Engagement. This afternoon, we're going to hear opening comments from Commissioner Cox, then a short presentation from Gerardo and the Commissioner. We will also move into question and answer and comment session and allow for a brief closing, including remarks from Alderman Sicho Lopez and DPD staff. You may ask your questions in writing through the chat box, <clears throat> excuse me, chat box, or simply type speak or hablar to be added to the queue of those who want to make verbal comments. Um, there are many people that have registered for this event going to limit all verbal comments to 90 seconds. We apologize for that. Um, on the screen are some ground rules. 
for community discussion this evening. Um, if you will allow me, I will read some of those rules. I'll read those rules. Um, step up and step back, uh, meaning we would love for people to um, all have an opportunity to speak, um, but to also limit your comments so that everybody who wants to speak will have an opportunity to do so. Assume the best intentions. Um, everyone who is here today um, has the intention of doing the best for the community. Um, avoid interruptions as much as possible. I know that we are, uh, most of us joining from home and we have other responsibilities around us. Um, and we ask you to express your truth respectfully and embrace discomfort. Um, these guidelines have been used for many virtual meetings hosted by the city of Chicago and I hope that they serve as a guide to ensure that we have a productive and respectful meeting. It is the intent this afternoon, as time permits, to listen to as many community voices as times allow. If we do not get to your question or you would prefer a response in writing, please make sure that you mail dpd at cityofchicago.org and someone from the planning department will get back to you promptly. Um, continued dialogue is the goal of today. And with that, I turn it over to Commissioner Cox for his opening remarks. Um, thank you, Norma. Uh, and uh, welcome everyone to the uh, second of three meetings uh, being, held, uh, being hosted by the Department of Planning and Development uh, to discuss the proposed landmark district for Pilsen and uh, other other neighborhood concerns. Um, we really appreciate your participation. Uh, if you attended the department's uh, first meeting last week, uh, you should know that the, the content and the format will uh, be largely the same uh, with only kind of minor revisions uh, to provide more detail and, and more clarity. Uh, the different start times and dates uh, are really meant to accommodate uh, as many people's schedule as possible. Uh, so I just wanna take a, a moment uh, to acknowledge that um, this is a difficult time. Uh, it's a difficult time to conduct uh, really effective community engagement. There is widespread economic and uh, there has been uh, civic unrest. Uh, we are all living through a pandemic uh, the public safety concerns are in paramount in our minds and, and other issues that, that challenge, really challenge our ability uh, to collectively plan for Pil Pilsen's future. Uh, nonetheless, uh, the city of Chicago um, feels we have a civic responsibility to engage residents about the preservation goals um, and to work with you to address these issues um, and many others. So first, uh, I wanna provide some background as to why, why we're here today. Um, it's obvious to me that the community meetings that DPD has hosted uh, about this district to date um, were ineffective. Um, we didn't comprehensively address the community's concerns uh, and the community had really limited opportunities for uh, public decision making. Um, so the department should have made clear uh, that we want to one, first listen, uh, two, to, uh, to offer our expertise, and three, uh, to help you uh, meet your goals for your community. That's something that's professionally and, and personally very important to me. Uh, it's clear uh, that we can do a better job for the, pil uh, the people of Pilsen. Acknowledging those shortcomings uh, and the pending city council decision on the proposed uh, landmark district, uh, I asked the zoning committee uh, this summer for uh, a six month extension for a decision on the district. The committee unanimously approved uh, the extra time to help foster conversations with residents, community organizations, uh, and the aldermen. I believe these discussions will result in one more flexibility, um, more openness, uh, and, and generally more understanding about our common goal, which is to preserve the people, the character, and uh, the culture 
of Pilsen. We received a lot of comments last week about uh, St. Uh, Albert, um, Aldebert's, um, the perceived cost of being in a historic district and, and even the origin of the district proposal. And I hope we can continue that process tonight of clarifying uh, issues. Um, the city's planning department is staffed by an incredibly dedicated group of urban planners uh, that are charged um, to respond to community's needs. And I hope you'll, you'll give us a chance to, to serve you uh, and to learn how a landmark district can be an effective tool for property owners, renters, uh, and businesses. Uh, and it's clear that there is an organized um, opposition to the pending district uh, designation that's, that's been in place uh, and working at this point for nearly two years now. And if the district doesn't, uh, does, um, well, if the district isn't formally adopted, uh, we want to use these meetings to start discussions with what kind of public resources could partially uh, serve the community in the district's absence. Um, it's really important that you understand that nothing is a foregone conclusion here. Um, we certainly are keeping an open mind and we hope you will uh, do the same. So uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to um, DPD's own um, Gerardo Garcia uh, to take us through uh, a presentation. Thanks, Commissioner, and thanks everyone for taking time out of your day uh, for being with us. Um, as the Commissioner noted, my, my name is Gerardo Garcia. I'm an architect and urban designer with the Department of Planning. Uh, like Norma, uh, también soy bilingüe, but for today's purposes and, and for the sake of everyone's time, um, I'll be giving the presentation in English uh, and folks can follow along with our translation services. Um, so we've got an agenda prepared today um, that's gonna cover a range of topics, um, everything from some of the neighborhood trends that we've seen uh, in the community um, to really trying to um, define and add some clarity to what a district is, uh, how it can be implemented as a tool, as well as discuss as, you know, what are some of the things that, has, that have changed since this district, district was first proposed um, as the commissioner noted a couple, a couple years ago. So, you know, the first um, kind of goal that we, that we have here is to really understand or, or to convey our understanding of um, what, what folks' concerns are as we've done planning work in the community as we've engaged with certain stakeholders, um, there's, a, there's a series of trends that um, are informing our work. Um, and we think it's important for uh, everyone to have a common understanding of what those are. And so, you know, some of the things that we know are, are that the Latino population in Pilsen uh, has decreased, right? Uh, and it's decreased by pretty significantly by about 14,000 people since um, the 2000 census or uh, since, 2000, since 2000. Um, and obviously that um, has stoked some concerns um, and uh, from residents of, you know, this strong immigrant uh, Mexican community uh, losing that character um, and losing that kind of cultural presence within the community. Um, we know that, um, you know, real estate developers and speculators um, have demolished more than 90 buildings in Pilsen uh, since 2006. And we also know that most of those buildings were replaced by larger, uh, more expensive um, uh, buildings in their place. And, and the other thing that was replaced by these larger, more expensive buildings were the affordable units and homes that were housed in the historic buildings. And so with population loss, um, with loss of affordable building stock, uh, the issue of affordability of displacement um, becomes compounded. And, um, and it's something that we certainly understand and that we've heard uh, from our engagement with folks. We also know that um, longtime homeowners are cost burdened um, and we have a, a, a good percentage of those uh, in Pilsen. 
Um, and that's for a number of reasons. Uh, deferred maintenance is an issue, but also property taxes and, and, and rising property taxes are becoming a burden for uh, longtime homeowners, many who are seniors and on fixed incomes and making it more difficult to uh, stay in their homes. And we, we also you know, have an understanding that legacy businesses are disappearing. Um, you know, obviously, Nuevo Leon restaurant pictured here was demolished as a result of a fire, not necessarily real estate speculation, but this is, um, th this is an occurrence that, that is happening um, in other parts of the district as well, or in other parts of Pilsen as well. And you know, we also understand, as we've seen in, in recent headlines, um, that a lot of the cultural expression um, through murals um, that has occurred in Pilsen um, really continues to be threatened. Um, you know, we've seen murals painted over, um, whether accidentally or intentionally, um, in, in a couple of other instances throughout the uh, throughout the community as well. Um, and I, I want to take the opportunity to, um, now that we've acknowledged these trends and these concerns, um, want to hand the presentation back over to Commissioner Cox, who um, is going to share a little bit about his background and, as he mentioned, why uh, the preservation of, of people and places are important to him. Um, thank you, Gerardo. I just, uh, being that I have um, been in Chicago uh, for a little over a year, uh, I thought it would be important for uh, residents to understand the background and experience I bring to this question of preservation. Um, in my um, early beginnings um, in public life, I uh, advocated for the first African-American low-income historic district in the neighborhood where I lived and was able to see over the period of time how we actually were able to increase affordable housing, um, uh, increase senior housing. So the buildings you see at the bottom are um, houses that were converted to affordable housing in this district. And it has been beautifully pre uh, preserved and the culture of that neighborhood has remained very much intact. Uh, next slide. And, that's, uh, and uh, I also worked in rural um, conservation of uh, black farming communities on the Eastern shore of Virginia, where I worked with um, residents who were interested in preserving the rural farm character of their community, but uh, addressed the issue of substandard housing um, that was a part of this uh, county. Go to the next slide. And over a six year period, um, I helped uh, community groups um, found the largest affordable housing uh, community on the Eastern shore, um, land that they owned and put into a conservation easement um, that would protect their farmland in perpetuity while they at the same time became the uh, shapers of their own community. Um, as you see below. Next. Uh, and during my time in New Orleans, uh, at post Katrina, when the Mardi Gras Indians, which is a celebrated cultural, um, cultural bears were being threatened, um, I worked with them to create a cultural district uh, in the area which they uh, called their home, next. Um, and assisted them in purchasing multiple buildings to be converted, to be preserved and converted into cultural anchors in that neighborhood. So when I come to Pilsen, I come with a very different lens than how uh, preservation districts have been used. I see them as a, a, a tool of empowerment. And uh, we're here to work with residents to make sure that any um, attempt to preserve uh, Pilsen preserves its culture and its people. And uh, I believe and I know that we can do something very, very special in Pilsen um, with the assistance of those on the ground. Um, so thank you for giving me an opportunity to just 
introduce myself through the work that I'm associated with, and uh, I look forward to working with you. Thanks, Commissioner. Um, so, you know, I, I think this is an opportunity to really um, try to ask the question, what, what is a landmark district and, and what exactly is it that um, this proposal is, uh, is seeking to do? Um, and so what we know about landmark districts is that they're traditionally tools to preserve buildings. Um, as you can see here, you know, this street shot from Pilsen uh, at the turn of the last century um, and the buildings that were erected by, you know, the previous generation of immigrants that were there. Um, but what we want to do is find a way to use it to preserve buildings and their stories. Um, and you, you see a similar uh, shot from today in Pilsen uh, with those very same buildings in the background. And so we want to be able to not just tell the stories of the people, but of the buildings, but also of the people that have uh, made this community special for, uh, for decades. And, you know, they also allow us the opportunity um, or to, uh, to prevent this type of development, which is, um, you can see here, um, uh, Noble Square, where we have historic buildings being surrounded by, again, larger, more expensive development. Um, and so this is a trend that we acknowledge and that we're seeing in Pilsen. Um, and we think, a, or we know that a district uh, can help us prevent this type of development. Um, and, you know, which we understand is, is a concern from uh, local residents as well. Um, and, you know, the, we, we, since the uh, district was, uh, has been in place, um, essentially for close to two years now, we have received a series of demolition applications. Um, and as you can see here, four of the five of those applications were denied um, for demolition of existing structures. Um, and it, it's reasonable to assume that if the landmark district um, isn't followed through on, um, we could see these applications come back along with uh, more than likely many others. And so, you know, the, looking at landmark districts on a more citywide scale, one thing that we can tell is that um, there's a lack of representation of landmarking on communities on the south and west sides. Um, if we look a little bit closer, um, we have 67 districts citywide. If we look closer at just designations, districts and buildings um, by ethnicity or that celebrate a certain uh, cultural heritage, um, we have eight that do that for uh, European immigrants, uh, one that does it for Asian immigrants, uh, 34 for African Americans, and really we have no uh, landmark districts or designations in the city that celebrate Latino culture or heritage, um, and certainly uh, Mexican culture falls within that as well. And so one of the questions that we've heard or concerns that we've heard um, is that a, you know, a landmark district will automatically uh, make it more expensive for uh, a, a property owner to maintain their home. Um, and and we, we feel that that's just not true. Um, for starters, there, there, if a landmark district occurs, there's no requirement uh, that anyone do any work to their property. Um, in the case of work that would require a permit would be the only case when the city, the city's landmarks division would review that permit application. Um, but just to give you a sense, you know, replacing an asphalt roof, uh, an asphalt shingle roof, uh, vinyl windows, repointing brick, replacing doors, you know, these are all typical kind of maintenance operations that uh, have to happen to a property. And really there is no cost difference between them being in a landmark district um, and then, you know, uh, and the cost associated with these repairs outside of a district. And we've also, you know, we, we've also heard of this concern of the landmark district, you know, burdening um, potentially a, a low income community or a lower income community. Um, and so, you know, we do have an example of a district, a landmark district in Chicago um, that was really born out of community activism. Uh, in the 1970s, 
the community in Pullman uh, organized to establish a landmark district to actually prevent an industrial development that was seeking to come in um, and essentially uh, replace their, their buildings and their community. And you know, it, we, what we know from Pullman is that it's very similar in scale um, to the proposed Pilsen district. It's comprised of a little over 1200 buildings, um, a little under 900 building parcels. Um, and the median income of the community, um, a very uh, diverse and mixed race community is about a little over $42,000 annually. And so this is an example of a community that's been able to be preserved um, within the city of Chicago. And so it begs the question, you know, can a landmark district be used to preserve, to aid in the preservation of Pilsen uh, and its people? Um, and I think it, it's worth revisiting um, some of the previous planning efforts that the city um, and community stakeholders have left, uh, have led. Um, and, you know, going back to the 2006 uh, uh, quality of life plan uh, that talks about uh, rehabilitation of structures and preventing demolition uh, in place of modern housing and preserving the character and beauty of Pilsen streets. Um, the quality of life plan from 2017 also talks about uh, creating cultural corridors and preserving murals. Um, and the Pilsen and Little Village Action Plan um, developed in collaboration with CMAP um, specifically talk about a, a landmark district to complement the National Register District. And so these, these are the planning efforts over the course of the last uh, 15, 20 years that the department has, uh, or the department took its cues from uh, when proposing uh, the landmark district. And so as a recap, what, what was that district? And so essentially it's a district that comprises 900 buildings, um, bounded by Levitt Street to the west, uh, jogging over to Ashland, uh, down to 21st Street, uh, and then jogging back up along Racine and Sangamon to the east. Um, and of course, extending across 18th Street, um, almost the entirety of the district. Uh, and it's about a, a quarter of a, of a square mile. Um, and again, as a, as a recap, um, the district preliminary landmark uh, recommendation for the district was made in December of 2018. Um, in May of 2019, uh, the final landmark recommendation uh, by the Landmarks Commission uh, was made to the City Council. Uh, and that started a, time, uh, a timeline of uh, the designation occurring within one year if there was no action by City Council. And so essentially we had until May of 2020 uh, to either make a decision or the, the council, city council had until May of 2020 to make a decision uh, uh, or, or, or to let the landmark designation pass. Um, obviously, um, during that time, um, we had COVID and the economic recession. Um, we also had early on uh, during that period conversations with Alderman Cicho Lopez, um, where he asked us to consider an alternative district boundary um, and um, because of COVID, all, all matters before city council were given a three months tolling extension. Um, and as a result of that, uh, the committee on zoning also approved a six month extension uh, to the ordinance to allow for this engagement that we're going through right now to occur uh, before bringing the matter up for a vote. Um, and so what that means is that we have until February of 2021 um, for the city council to vote on the matter of the landmark district. So what has changed, uh, obviously in, the, in that timeline, um, you know, we, we've investigated um, a, a smaller boundary focusing on commercial corridors for the landmark district. We've also looked at um, how to refocus some of our financial resources um, to complement that, that smaller boundary. And so that's what we're gonna talk about here um, and so again, just as a recap, the original boundary, 900 bu buildings, a quarter of a, of a square mile, um, and uh, a revised boundary uh, that ex essentially extends to Levitt to the west and Sangamon to the east, but really focuses on buildings along 18th Street 
in Blue Island Avenue um, down to 21st Street. And so focusing on the mixed use mercantile buildings of the area. Um, and this designation essentially yields about 465 buildings. And so one thought that, that we had is, is, you know, how can we reconsider our financial resources to assist longtime homeowners and property owners in Pilsen, um, you know, to make any repairs that they wish to their properties. Um, and so as a pilot, the department um, has essentially allocated $3 million from the adopt a, landmark, adopt a Landmark Fund for commercial buildings um, and for use by long-term property owners over three years. Um, that, would, uh, that would be um, available um, upon passage of the Landmark District immediately. So some other things that have changed as we've heard a lot of these concerns and uh, uh, questions by the community about, you know, if, if we are going to focus on a commercial, uh, a smaller commercial district, um, again, that we explored at the request of the alderman, what happens to the other residential properties? They're still gonna see the pressure that we've seen from development. Um, how can we target our other city resources through our department of, of housing um, to further assist those longtime homeowners? Um, and how can we further target and um, uh, conserve and promote new public art uh, within Pilsen with our Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events? Um, so gonna talk a little bit about some of the tools that we have available to achieve these three goals, hopefully. Um, and that, in, that the, and ideally would complement a landmark district. And, and, and what these boil down to is, you know, how do we conserve um, and protect naturally occurring affordability that we know happens in the older building stock of the community? Um, and again, as I mentioned, how do we help long-term property owners finance repairs to their homes um, that may be, may be residential focused? Um, and how do we conserve and promote, again, public art? And so we know that 70% um, of uh, the population in Pilsen are renters. We know that 30% of the of folks in, in Pilsen are property owners. And of those 30%, 43% are longtime property owners. Um, and we're defining that as 10 plus years of owning a property based on the data that we have from, uh, from the census. Um, and as you can see here, you know, you can see how some of these newer buildings, um, you know, are, are being developed around uh, Pilsen and around this older housing stock. And so one thought, uh, one, one proposal is essentially a, um, a density preservation overlay. Um, and of the housing stock in Pilsen, uh, we know that a vast majority, if you count, you know, anything two units plus, that's 86% of the buildings in Pilsen are multifamily. Um, and again, we know that a lot of that naturally occurring affordability occurs in these, you know, two flats and above. And so what we want to do is disincentivize the demolition of these buildings to, um, you know, create more expensive buildings, for example, larger, more expensive single family homes. Um, and so a preservation, a density preservation overlay allows us to do that um, and to preserve the, the density of Pilsen, uh, which, you know, would hopefully yield uh, uh, more of that naturally occurring affordability. Um, another tool that we have at our disposal is the special character overlay district. Um, and this, uh, this overlay was actually um, uh, revised and approved by council uh, not too long ago. Um, and what, a, what a, uh, a, a character overlay district does is that it provides expectations, clear expectations for new construction and, and rehabilitation of, uh, with, by, the, by the implementation of district specific guidelines. Um, and these guidelines are developed and these expectations are developed uh, with community consensus and involvement. Um, and, you know, the other thing that's uh, to note here is that we can make special requirements for uh, any new construction on city owned land 
Um, but the difference here between a character overlay district and a landmark district is that a character overlay district will not prevent demolitions. Um, but this is a tool that many communities across the city have uh, asked for um, and that we've revised and uh, through city council, the ordinance that allows us to implement this tool um, to allow greater flexibility to meet the needs of local communities. Um, and we're working towards implemented in several communities across the city. Um, and then, you know, we want to talk about the Department of, of Housing and some of the resources that it could bring to bear uh, for Pilsen. And the Department of Housing um, has essentially committed $3 million for both Pilsen and Little Village um, for property owners to refinance um, their properties um, and to reinvest in their, in their properties um, so that uh, in, in exchange for, for some of that affordability that's occurring in those properties to remain. Um, and so that's another tool that um, we can bring to, to the table in a more comprehensive fashion. Um, and finally, again, you know, this idea of documenting the history of murals um, and cultural expression in Pilsen is something that um, we would want to um, uh, partner with the Department of Cultural Affairs and special events to, to do, um, but also to support the artist community by commissioning new works of art um, in the community as well. And so really what we're hoping is, again, to um, devise a strategy here that's not just about a landmark district, uh, which is mainly a tool to preserve buildings, um, but also to supplement it with other strategies and tools um, that'll help us preserve uh, the community and people of Pilsen as well. So with that, I'm gonna hand it back over to Norma, who's gonna take us through the rest of the agenda, uh, including our question and answer period. Thank you, Gerardo, and thank you, Commissioner uh, Cox. Uh, we are now moving into um, the, uh, our comment period of the agenda. Um, again, you may submit your questions in writing through the chat box or simply type speak or hablar in the chat box to be added to the queue of those who want to make verbal uh, questions, um, make uh, comments or ask verbal questions. Um, and we may prioritize individuals who did not get a chance to speak in last week's meeting. Um, <clears throat> as a reminder, if we do not get to your question or you would prefer a response in writing, please make sure that you email dpd at cityofchicago.org and someone from the planning department will get back to you promptly. Uh, we have more than 90 people who have registered for this event. So we're gonna uh, limit our verbal comments to 90 seconds. And you're gonna hear me when you have about 20 seconds left. Uh, I'll just interrupt you to let you know that. And we respectfully ask you to summarize. Uh, we do this to make sure that we hear from as many um, individuals as possible and uh, this I also am going to ask our city staff to be as brief in their responses so that we can again hear from as many voices um, as possible and I ask uh, to you to remember uh, to be as respectful as possible with your questions so I am going to start um, again this week like last week we've received many questions and comments through email and even through um, questions asked in the chat today. Um, so I'm gonna start with one from Greg Stepanek that says, why hasn't landmark status for St. Adalva Church and related buildings been pursued as yet? It is vital to save these buildings from potential demolition of remodeling since they are an integral part of the Pilsen community and represent an important segment in the community's history reflecting the Polish community's past contributions to Pilsen and serving as their legacy. Uh, variations of this question were also submitted by Jacqueline Baez, Margot Dumel, and Julie Sawecki. Um, no, I'm, I'm happy to, to start. Um, you know, firstly, St. Uh, at Alberts uh, is, you know, clearly uh, an iconic, um, neighborhood treasure. Um, and I think the city kind of shares the neighborhoods and the alderman's desire 
uh, to see this building kind of permanently protected. Um, I, I think that we, uh, we fully kind of expect it to be designated, um, but it has to be done uh, once uh, it's been determined uh, what the Chicago Archdiocese and the Catholic Church intend to do with the complex. Um, in the meantime, I know that the sanctuary has been deconsecrated uh, and um, uh, it's as much a, as a part of this community, I think, as the commercial buildings uh, and the homes in Pilsen. The only major difference is it's the homes and the commercial buildings that we are seeing um, uh, requests to demolish. And so the, the big important church is not in an immediate threat um, to be demolished. It's those single homes, it's those mercantile buildings that, that um, we have traced uh, come in one at a time. I think both the, the church uh, and the convent are, are orange-rated buildings. And that means that there would be a hold on any demolition permit um, if it were to come to us, um, which would provide, you know, the city, the opportunity to seek landmark status. So I, I don't think, I'm confident that the church is not under imminent threat of demolition while those single homes and those commercial buildings are uh, every, every, um, every chance uh, that we've been able to document. So um, we share your passion for your church uh, and we intend uh, to protect it by every means that we have but it is not the uh, subject of imminent threat of demolition. Thank you, Commissioner. I will move on to a next question, which comes to us from Virginia Lugo. Instead of landmark, why can't city take other measures like putting a demolition stop and helping owners fix up these properties? So, uh, I, I mean, I certainly um, feel that there are a set of tools. I think we are trying to suggest that it's not one single tool. Um, we need to bring multiple tools, you know, six or seven or eight tools that work uh, in tandem with each other. The, the landmark district is a very effective tool that when someone submits a permit, uh, a request to demolish, um, we get to press the pause button. We get to convene um, residents in a public hearing setting. Uh, and that applicant has to prove uh, that this building uh, needs to be demolished. Uh, and, uh, and then this commission gets to vote. Uh, and we have seen uh, over the course of the time of the proposed um, district, how many demolitions have been rejected. Uh, and this is not a, a, a six month moratorium. Um, this is a permanent mechanism that we will have uh, to stop the demolition. It has to be, it un, the, the landmark status also unleashes additional resources that we can then deploy to make available to property owners. And so we can take the same adopt the landmark uh, fund that the city has that makes resources available to historic districts. And we can apply that to the mercantile buildings, the everyday buildings in Pilsen. And that is a, an innovation uh, that we're committed to bringing um, to Pilsen, uh, in addition to homeowner grants that are sorely needed for people to do basic repair of the exterior of their homes. So it is our firm belief that no one tool is going to preserve Pilsen, but if we bring all of these tools together simultaneously, that we can make progress. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, we are gonna be moving to someone who would like to speak. Um, I believe Marta Herrera. Um, if you could uh, please step forward and you will have 90 minutes, 90 seconds to share. Yes, hello. We can hear you. 
Okay, so my question is, why was there not any community input? Simple as that. Mm -hmm. um, you... Eleanor or Matt, I think um, this is a good question for you guys to maybe jump in on and, and give some background on the designation process going back a couple of years. Sure, I can take that. This is Eleanor Gorski. Um, thanks, Gerardo. So the designation process started, I believe it's two years ago now at this point. And the process started by the Landmarks Commission issuing a report on the history of the district. And this report was distributed and put online for the public and um, public meetings were scheduled to discuss the history of the district and the next steps in the landmark process. Um, the public meetings certainly got a lot of response from community members and the, that response was conveyed to the Landmarks Commission. Unfortunately, uh, demolitions were being applied for at the same time as the process was started. And per Landmarks Ordinance, we were asked to uh, um, truncate the process to address the demolitions. So we didn't have the entire length of time we desired to create community, uh, more thorough community dialogue. And in May of, I believe it was 2019, this went to a vote at the Landmarks Commission. Again, these are all public meetings after a public hearing. And then that was passed on to city council. And it's been in council since that time for consideration for a council vote. Um, throughout the process, the property owners in the district were notified via certified mail multiple times as to when each one of these community processes and meetings were taking place, as well as to ask for their opinion as to if the district should be designated. And I see Gerardo has put up the district timeline and that's outlined in the municipal code as to the steps that need to be taken, need to be taken place um, in a landmark district. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. Um, I am going to move on to our next question. And uh, this comes from Matthew Martinez. What has the 34 landmark districts done for the African American community in Chicago? I mean, I, I'm not sure who um, is available to talk about them, um, but I would argue first and foremost, they're still there. The buildings are still there uh, as a kind of cultural memory of that particular building and the culture that it represents. So, you know, representation matters. Uh, and it's the first step to uh, a broader acknowledgement of the contribution. Uh, it hasn't driven anyone away, um, but it has acknowledged uh, the importance of all neighborhoods uh, in Chicago, whether they be uh, on the west side or the south side or the north. Uh, and I am um, obviously concerned uh, that there is no uh, Latino representation at all uh, even though this community is one third uh, Latino. And so the Pilsen uh, Landmark District would formally acknowledge the value of that immigrant community and Mexican community contribution uh, to Chicago. Thank you, Commissioner. I'm gonna move on to uh, um, someone who would like to speak um, and that is Ward Miller. So Ward Miller, if you would, um Please um, share your thoughts and you have 90 seconds. You hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, my name is Ward Miller. I'm with Preservation Chicago. We at Preservation Chicago fully support the proposed Pilsen Landmark District and the, and the two concepts for either the original plan or the alternative plan of, of either 465 mostly commercial buildings or the original plan of 900 buildings. We also support the landmark designation of St. Adelbert and feel that this landmark, that these landmark districts and these landmarks 
are great tools, not only to preserve the historic buildings, which, re which represent a rich variety of culture and history, but also long-term residents, small businesses, and current residents. We understand some of the issues and want to encourage the city continue to work with the community, uh, Alderman Cicho Lopez and other city departments, and also with the county and tax assessor Fritz Kagi to give some types of tax incentives or tax breaks to residents, resident owners, long-term residents and, and businesses in Pilsen in addition to additional city programs and perhaps those city programs could be expanded Realize that may, realizing that maybe even a community benefits agreement similar to what was reached in Woodlawn for the Obama Presidential Center could be part of that Mr. discussion. Miller, you have 20 seconds if you would please well, wrap up. Thank you. Thank you so much and appreciate the time. And, and we at Preservation Chicago are more than willing to uh, work with the community. Uh, Alderman Cicho Lopez, who we've also been working with uh, over the past year, and, uh, and of course the city uh, towards some type of preservation goal here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Um, and I believe that there was a comment, so I will move into the next question that comes from Diana Fuentes. What can we do to lower property taxes? Um, well, I think as the uh, previous speaker um, articulated, uh, the tax assessor's office uh, has to be at the table. Uh, and I have shared with the alderman that I am more than willing um, to shape uh, a proposal um, to him, um, you know, they have been very reluctant uh, to change the tax structure for specific areas, um, but that doesn't mean that uh, a robust conversation um, should not, that we should not engage them in a very robust conversation. Uh, and I'm happy and willing to work um, with um, community organizations uh, to try to make that case, uh, as it appears the preservation organizations will as well. But know that um, in the past, um, the, the desire um, to have a special taxing structure um, for uh, districts of this type uh, have been uh, largely rebuffed um, uh, by the um, assessor's office, uh, but we should continue to try. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I am moving on to our next question that comes from Matthew Martinez. So the city won't help, <clears throat> excuse me. So the city will not help preserve the murals unless there is a landmark status? Um, absolutely not. Uh, our commitment to preserving um, the mural, the collection of murals is completely independent of a landmark uh, status. We we are ready um, to begin to work with those uh, organizations on the ground that produce this cultural resource um, to, to assure that they are preserved uh, and that new ones are commissioned. Uh, that work can move forward independent of a landmark status. Thank you, Commissioner. I'm going to continue um, uh, with someone who would like to speak, but uh, would like to remember, remind uh, those making comments um, in the chat um, to please be respectful with your comments. Uh, we have our next uh, speaker, uh, Laura Paz. Laura, if you'd like to speak, please. Laura, are you ready to ask your question or make your comment? Okay, perhaps uh, Laura is not ready. I'm gonna come back to Laura after I ask the question in the chat. That Okay, I'm ready. Can you hear me now? Yes, Laura, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, I'm a home, a property owner in Pilsen. Y quiero saber por qué esa junta no está en español. I wanna know why this, this is not in Spanish so that property owners and others can understand it. First of all, I wanna say that in Pilsen, we don't want the landmark. Um, we do want stopping the demolitions, but we don't want them. This is what the community is saying. And I don't know why you don't listen to what the community is saying. 
Mr. Cox, you have no credibility because of the fact that Lori Lightfoot chose you. And she is the same person who said that Pilsen was a neighborhood 10 years ago that you would not want to be found after dark. What does that mean? 10 years ago is when 10,000 Mexicans were displaced by Caucasian people, okay? So you have no credibility because she chose you. She's the same person who before she even became mayor said that $2.5 billion was okay for the 78 project and for the, uh, for the Lincoln Yards project. And you're talking about $3 million for homeowners to help them when there's all this money that the super billionaires are getting. We don't want the landmark. Please understand that. And if you believe in democracy, let the people decide. We don't need experts. We don't need people coming from New Orleans or wherever you came from. We, the people, el pueblo, this is what we believe. We voted for Byron Sicho Lopez because we thought that he Ms. would do Pass, this. you have 20 seconds, Ms. Pass? Anyway, the bottom line for all this is we want, thank you for wanting to save the murals. Thank you very much for that. We appreciate that, but we don't want the landmark and you must understand that we wanna vote. Why don't you bring it to a vote so that we can vote no on it? This is what the issue is. And this is why we have, Lori Lightfoot has no credibility with, with how she talked about our community. Thank you. So Thank racist you, in our community. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Commissioner Cox, I believe that uh, I, I mostly was a comment, but I think there was a question about why is this not in Spanish? Can, I can answer that. The, the, we actually are offering um, simultaneous translation services. Um, so I'll go back to the, uh, the first slide. Um, anyone that uh, would like to uh, listen to the remainder of the meeting in Spanish uh, can dial in. Uh, eh, la pregunta era por qué no está la, la, esta reunión ofrecida en español. Uh, y si estamos ofreciendo traducción uh, en español, eh, si, si gustan pueden llamar el número de acceso, que, el número de teléfono que está en la pantalla uh, con el código de acceso que está presente para escuchar la reunión en español. Thank you, Gerardo. I am going to move on to the next question that comes from Leonor Vanek. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Does the revised presentation being presented, Smaller Boundaries, replace the current landmark district? What will occur to the landmark district as it stands as presented with the extension to January? If the majority of the homeowners um, and businesses do not want this to go forward with any landmark district? I know it was a long question. Would you like me to repeat that? Um, Eleanor or Matt, I, I'd, I'd look to you guys to chime in on this one. Norma, can you repeat the first part of the question? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> does the revised presentation being presented replace the current landmark district? Yes. And the second part of the question is, what will occur to the landmark district if the majority of the homeowners and businesses do not want this to go forward with any landmark districts? That's why we're here. Well, that's why the commissioners convene these meetings to listen. And he's been very clear that the Landmarks District is not a foregone conclusion. Thank you so much <clears throat> for that answer. Um, I believe that there are um, second and third parts of the question that say, what are the ramifications to the property and business owners of the landmark district of those that are in the proposed overlay district? Right. Um, well, uh, if, if the landmark district is um, passed by council, um, immediately um, grants uh, will be made available to uh, property owners um, on um, 18th Street uh, and uh, and Blue Island and any structures that are um, uh, mercantile buildings. Um, that's one thing from, from day one, those resources in the form of grants, uh, not loans, will be made available uh, to business owners. Uh, secondarily, we are working with the Department of, Planet, of, of Housing 
um, to develop a, a menu of um, grants made available to homeowners uh, to do exterior improvements uh, in, uh, in their, um, in the district, but also throughout uh, Pilsen uh, and including uh, the neighborhood of Little Village. Uh, so what we're trying to do is develop a robust set of tools that are work, that work simultaneously. Uh, the one that is dependent on um, the landmarks district uh, is the um, grants from the Adopt the Landmark Fund, uh, if that clarifies the point. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, and we are now going to move to a speaker. Um, uh, up next is Julie Sawicki. Ms. Sawicki, if you would please um, share your comment or your question. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for this meeting. Um, full disclosure um, about myself, I am actually a real estate broker and I am also one of the founders of the Society of St. Adelberts and its current president. Um, thank you, Commissioner Cox, for your continued attention on the matter. Um, but I would like to make a couple of remarks um, for, the, for the general um, audience listening here today that our plan for the site is really very much consistent with, with everyone's, I think, intention of preserving the character of Pilsen. Um, and uh, we wish this site to remain a Catholic site as has been its original intention um, as built by our immigrant ancestors. So for us, this is very much um, a question of preservation of, of what our immigrant ancestors accomplished here and what has been a Catholic site for over 143 years. And very quickly, our plan is to preserve the church as either a shrine or a chapel and to convert the convent into a uh, 40 room um, or probably less uh, B&B style retreat house. Uh, we would like to market this retreat house around the world and drive faith-based tourism to St. Adelbert's. And it would be this retreat house that would uh, be an internal revenue generator that would sustain the property uh, for the next 143 years and not rely on perpetual fundraising or any kind of government funds to sustain it. It would also create jobs for the community. It would preserve population density and all of the- Mr. Wecky, you have 20 seconds. So what, what I don't understand is the, um, the Archdiocese of Chicago, since it closed its church, the ordinance to uh, keep this site as is uh, no longer applies. The permission of the cardinal is not required because the 1983 or 87 ordinance no longer applies. And the only explanation here, Commissioner Cox, is that perhaps DPD is if interested- you could wrap in, up, Ms. Sawicki? It, yes, in a real estate um, plan here, which I have heard from several sources, and I'm hoping that you can address, and I hope that that is not the case. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wiki. Um, well, to the speaker, I would just say, you know, you have a, a compelling vision for what uh, the reuse uh, of St. Ed, Ed Albert's uh, might be. Um, I suspect that there are a number of other compelling ideas for um, the reuse uh, of the structure. Uh, I think we need to create a process uh, where all of those ideas are given um, the benefit of putting together a proposal. Uh, and so far that has not happened. Uh, and the um, Chicago Diocese, Archdiocese and Catholic Church have not um, released the property um, to, to, be, uh, to explore these al alternatives. And so we're committed to working uh, with them. Uh, in the meantime, we keep a very uh, watchful eye, uh, as your group does as well, uh, to make sure that the building is preserved. Uh, but um, we really need um, the full cooperation of the Archdiocese and the Catholic Church in order uh, to explore your, your idea as well as other ideas uh, for uh, the adaptive reuse of uh, this structure. But uh, I'm very, very, very committed uh, to preserving that neighborhood icon. Um, we will not allow it 
um, to be demolished. Uh, and uh, I also look forward to exploring um, a number of reuses uh, for the church. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I just want to remind our participants that we have um, about 10 minutes left of uh, questions and comments. Um, and with that, I'm moving on to a next question, uh, which uh, is, uh, what is the threshold that DPD currently has set to change the proposed district area? And what are the indicators for this? Um, well, uh, the district as was a pro uh, proposed and forwarded to council um, has to be uh, voted um, on uh, by the council uh, and the date to do that has been established um, in February. Uh, it's ultimately going to be uh, city council's decision. Um, our, our job, our job is to have a conversation, the, create a forum for, for residents to hear what they have to say, and all of that will be factored into any final decision. Um, because the uh, proposal was formally submitted to council, um, we unfortunately cannot come back uh, later uh, and redo this. Um, we get one chance to do it. Um, it will be after this period of discussion, it will be in the hands of city council um, to vote on. Thank you, commissioner. We have an additional question from the chat box. For the new proposed area presented last week, what steps are needed to get the buy-in from those affected in the area and introducing this to the community and zoning slash city council? Can you repeat um, the question? I, I was going to suggest I can, I can take that, um, no. Commissioner, but please yes. repeat the question. Yes. For the new proposed area presented last week, what steps are needed to get the buy-in from those affected in the area and introducing this to the community and the zoning slash city council? Um, great question. So as Commissioner Cox responded in the last uh, response, this is now in the hands of council. So if council decides that the proposed boundary, the larger boundary is not acceptable, council can, provo can propose a smaller boundary. And the smaller boundary that we showed would be a cohesive commercial district and that would also meet landmark standards and guidelines. So that would have to be a discussion within city council itself. That is not something that would go back to landmarks or through the department. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. Um, and now I'm going to move into someone who would like to speak or ask a question, uh, Javier Ruiz. Mr. Ruiz, if you will please ask your question or make your comment. And you have yeah. 90 seconds. Yeah, I, I got one comment and a question. So um, you all talk about, you know, regulating demolitions, right? And they're, um, if you're concerned about regulating the demolitions, why don't we just copy the 606 anti-demolition ordinance on the north side? Uh, simple as that, right? There's already many ways to stop demolitions without having the landmark. Now for my question though, is why are you all so persistent on pushing this landmark when nobody wants it? Commissioner, may I may I step in for this Please one? Do. Please do. Um, this this is Eleanor Gorski. So um, the council is working on the six hundred six ordinance and how to implement that. And essentially, what that ordinance does is it gives a six month moratorium on demolitions. And it asks for a study to be done as to what can further happen in that area. That study is currently underway. And that study is showing that a density um, overlay district is probably going to be the next step for that area. And that is why we're introducing those concepts to you as a community, because if the demolition moratorium, the same type passes in this community, we expect that legally that's the same path that would happen here in Pilsen, that it would be in place for six months 
and then a different mechanism would need to be put in place legally in order to combat demolitions. Um, I don't know, Commissioner, if you have anything to add to that, but I just wanted to make sure folks were clear as to what that ordinance does and the limitations of any demolition ordinance that is being put forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. Um, we have time for one more question, and this comes from Enrique Magaña. Has anyone considered requiring developers to save facades or have the city slash neighborhood approve architecture to keep the aesthetic integrity of Pilsen and Chicago's architectural history? I, I could answer that one as well. So we do have two ways to do that. Um, the first is the landmark district. And then we recently have the toll pass at the last uh, zoning committee meeting, which is the character district. And that's also why we brought that to your attention um, so that you were aware if the district did not pass, that would be another tool that you could use in the Pilsen community. Um, and I'm seeing in the chat that Mr. Um, Ruiz, I believe is saying we did not answer my question. Um, could someone remind me what the second part of his question is? I don't know, Norma or Commissioner, if you recall what that was. Or Mr. Reese, if you wanna type it again, I'm happy to address it. Yeah, my question basically is, why are you all persistent in pushing this plan when nobody wants it? Um, so the purpose of this meeting today is to respond to what the zoning committee had asked and agreed for us to do which is to have more community outreach. So the zoning committee and council can make a decision when this does come for a vote. And, uh, you know, I, I would just say, you know, this, um, this proposal um, was created uh, before my tenure as commissioner. Um, and I feel um, a certain obligation to have it have a fair uh, public vetting um, and ask for time um, outside of the pandemic that we um, were uh, taken by to get information out uh, to residents. Because um, I, I know of this tool, um, I know that um, hundreds of communities across the United States have effectively used these tools uh, to empower their community. And I, I believe it's possible here, uh, everything from the boundaries to the governance structure, it, it is ours to create and shape in a way that works for Pilsen residents. So our job is to create a forum um, for public discourse it's not to push ideas, it's to present ideas and present the facts uh, and then allow um, residents to draw their own conclusions. And that's what this process uh, is for me. Uh, we haven't made any conclusions, uh, but we do feel uh, a civic responsibility to create the forum where people can civilly debate ideas and tools. Um, so I hope that uh, people will have more information than they had um, before um, they attended uh, such a session. Thank you, Commissioner. And unfortunately, this uh, ends our um, comment section. Um, I do want to remind everyone that all of the questions that were posed in the chat will be answered by staff um, in writing um, and will be posted at a later time. Um, and with that, I would like to uh, move in to our section and invite our um, Alderman uh, Sicho Lopez to speak. Um, Alderman, uh, you have five minutes and I'll only interrupt uh, when you have one minute left. Yeah, and, and I'll be clear, I think that, you know, I'm not part of this uh, agenda neither. Uh, I'm gonna be time because it's important, you know, so I'll be, done when I'm done, uh, because it's important, as Commissioner Cox mentioned, we need to be factual. And I think the residents need to understand 
uh, clearly what's happening. And with Factual, I have to share with you uh, links with information. So I'm not gonna be time, so I'm gonna be done when I'm gonna be done. One of the things that Department of Planning has said multiple times was that the importance of um, making sure that we listen to the communities. Uh, that has not happened. We have been acting in good faith since uh, April 2020, when it was first announced without any community feedback or any, um, any community plan that the landmark was ever a strategy to address displacement or address one of the main issues that we have in our community that is already uh, widely known in Pilsen. Commissioner Cox that barely has a year here in Chicago, perhaps, um, are starting to get to know that that is the problem that we are trying to solve here. Uh, so we're still not being able to get a conversation from the Department of Planning that is a two-way street. Uh, about the, uh, some, of the, some of the things that I think there are not factual, my administration has never asked for reconsideration or amendments or changes on this landmark designation after we receive multiple affidavits, over 300 affidavits in a 95% of opposition from homeowners in the district, we have said that we support the residents and we are not in support of this plan that is created by DPD and DPD only. Um, we were forced to get, uh, and I, get, I keep hearing about this uh, extension uh, of the unanimous vote. The unanimous vote was a bad taste maneuvering of the Life Food Administration to either force us to either take the extension or impose the landmark. So of course, you know, within the council members, they voted, you know, to make sure that we don't get this landmark imposed because even then there were concerns about this being imposed in our community. The other issue that I have is that, you know, we talk about and I hear our residents are concerned about property tax assessments and we are seriously concerned about that. We are in conversations with the housing department we are in conversations with the assessor's office. In fact, we have right now an ordinance that was um, introduced by Commissioner Anaya, which will help with um, relief or tax incentives for homeowners, especially those small homeowners, long-term homeowners that are having difficulties with their taxes and are keeping the rents affordable to qualify for tax incentives, which is something that this landmark doesn't do at all. In fact, the rates of property tax assessments by this proposal could potentially complicate this kind of process and these appeals and these uh, incentives that we are proposing with uh, the, the, the county. Another thing that is important to acknowledge is that here, you know, I hear a lot of great hearts uh, that are all of a sudden care about Pilsen, but some of the same people in the Department of Planning, and I hear the number, uh, 14,000 residents that were displaced from Pilsen in the last 10, 20 years now, well, some of these same department uh, the staff were okay with displacement just a few years ago when they had an administration that was rubber stamped for whatever they proposed. Now we have an administration that is not a community member. Uh, I know that my administration works with policymakers. I'm kind of uh, surprised that Preservation Chicago, which has been uh, in the meetings, Preservation Chicago, uh, Mr. Miller, you have been in the meeting, in the, at least in the big public uh, meeting that we had and you presented all the information to the residents with over 400 attendees. Again, the vast majority of residents rejected this because it doesn't have the support and it doesn't serve the public interest. The reason why we have a lot of uh, Latino neighborhoods who do not have any landmarks. If you look at Lincoln Square, if you look at uh, Lincoln Park, if you look at Wicker Park, there's, and there were used to be Latino communities. They are landmarks now. And you see if there's any trace of the social fabric of the culture of the community. Let's look at the facts and the history in our community. They also, one of the things that I, I keep hearing and I do think is, in, is important um, that we wanna talk about assisting those people on the ground and collaborating with the groups. Let's be noting that there's no one single community group that wants to get their hands dirty in this process. That's why we don't have anybody in the call or any facilitators. What we wanna make sure is that we do have uh, help for those on the ground. And I think it's fine and very problematic, for instance, that St. Adelbert is not being landmark. I cannot think of another building that is, you know, that is more a clear landmark than St. Adelbert. But the reason is why, because developers keep eyeing at that property, at that site, against our will, and we support the landmarking of St. Adelbert as an iconic site. And we should have the same consideration that the, this, the, the Life Food Administration 
has for the archdiocese with homeowners, meaning that this should be a voluntary process. If people want to landmark their buildings, let's make it they can landmark their buildings. We'll be happy to help them with that process. But the fact is that this is already a historic district. I share with you constituents, I share with you the, the qualifications and the guidelines to qualify for a lot of these grants. We are a Pilsen is a historic district, yet a lot of these incentives are not accessible to a lot of the residents. And the landmark will be another, yet another way to, to displace residents that are not able to keep the facades in the exact same line as previous, um, you know, on the previous state, original state. This is- Alderman, if you could wrap up I'm your not going to be interrupted. I've been very clear. I'm not going to be interrupted because this is my opportunity to refer to my constituents in our word. I'm a local official. I'm not going to be interrupted. So again, and I'm going to, I'm going to be done when I'm finished. So when, when we're talking about the importance, you know, that we have in order to talk about preservation, we got to make sure that these incentives are accessible to residents. Who, who right now has those, those 25% of the value of the property, 25% set aside so that they can qualify for these incentives? Only developers, people who have resources. You know, so again, I want to just show you how this proposal is not for long term residents, it's not for the residents period of our community. This is for the developers who are not only going to get the, the, the money for repairs, but tax reasons for after 10 years. This is not something that we're going to get behind because the evidence suggests there's no one single peer review article that says that landmarking helps address the number one issue that we have identified as a community, which is displacement. Not one single peer review. Uh, Commissioner Cox just in the last meeting recognized and acknowledged on his public record because apparently public record gets lost sometimes. But it is public record that Commissioner Cox and you know you can go to the public media and said that this does not help address displacement and that's the issue that we want to address here in our community. We want to make sure that people have the right for self determination and we are not going to let departments impose their will and the ideology and their plans on a community that has said unanimously no. 95% of the people have said no. Rehabbing buildings is indeed an expensive endeavor. Imagine what it is to rehab a building, an old building to the original state. Of course it's expensive. Let's be honest about it. Let's stop deceiving our residents. The other thing that I want to make sure that we're clear is that we have an alternative. We have, and I think I will finish with this, it's very important for our residents to know that our administration is working to make sure that we are addressing the one number one issue that we have, which is property tax assessments. It is a ridiculous way uh, for the city and the county to continue to assess it the way they have been assessing. We are working with the assessor's office. There's right now at the county level um, um, an ordinance in Commissioner Anaya's office who will help us to make sure that those homeowners who are keeping the rents affordable to qualify to those tax incentives and those tax grants and those tax relief for those who are helping the community by keeping the rents affordable. We also have a demolition freeze ordinance that is clear by the legal department that is in the zoning committee. And I urge, please, the zoning chair, Alderman Tony, to keep to put that for a vote so that we have the same courtesy that other communities have had, like around the 606 for a six month uh, freeze so that we can have a conversation with the Department of Planning on how we're going to reform our current demolition uh, or, uh, process that continues to favor the same developers that I'm, I'm sure they're still uh, happy to continue to see this process to be lingering because the more time that passes, the less time is for us to implement these policies that we have at all disposal and they need to be implemented right away. The same about mural. Because I keep hearing about the murals, we can have an ordinance to preserve the and over 117 murals. In respect for everybody's time, I'm, I'm speaking. 117 murals that we have in our community have been recognized as historic murals. We can pass an ordinance to preserve them and put funding to it. Let's put the funding where our mouths are. But the Department of Planning needs to start a conversation with our administration with housing, with the assessor's office, and stop having a conversation among yourselves. That is an urgent call. We need this council, we need our chairman to put this for a vote at the next November meeting, in November meeting, because my concern is what we see, and unfortunately I heard this in other communities, like in the 43rd ward, when I'll residents have opposed, and I'm almost done, I'm almost done. When we have like 40, when we have residents opposing projects, 
we have these so-called community meetings, quote unquote, where we have three meetings and yet somehow the, the outcome is different to what the will of the residents are. So please, let's make sure in our community that we are mindful. I'm showing you the data, the evidence we have taken over to, over a year to analyze carefully so that we know that this is in the best interest of our community. This is not in the best interest of our community. Again, we, we can see clearly with the case of San Adalbert, this is clearly benefiting developers. This is not helping the community at large. Let's work together to make sure that we have a conscious development we do not have an administration that bends over to any administration, any department of developers. We have an administration who listens to you, my constituents, the stakeholders, the people in our community, and our community has said no, voted in the November meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman. And with that, I move it to the commissioner to give closing remarks. Um, so uh, thank you. Thank you, Norma, and, uh, and thank you, um, Alderman Cicho Lopez, um, really thank everyone uh, for your patience uh, and for participating today. Um, I think hopefully, you know, you've gained uh, a little more insight into some of the goals uh, and some of the ways that um, we can achieve them. And there are multiple uh, ways to achieve, I think, this common goal. Uh, I mean, clearly, you know, there are conflicting perspectives, uh, conflicting perspectives about what's the most effective way to, uh, to approach uh, Pilsen's future? Um, and how, how much of the neighborhood's legacy will, will, will survive the uh, clear market forces that are, uh, that are being posed? Um, and uh, hopefully I think we'll succeed um, in creating um, a way forward. Uh, I certainly, um, feel uh, that we've been successful in creating at least a safe forum uh, where people can speak freely uh, their minds and, and submit their comments uh, for, for additional consideration uh, to the planning uh, staff and, and we hear them. Um, I just wanna uh, make it clear that the city is not wedded uh, to any one tool uh, and that the decision to formally designate Pilsen's landmark district is in the hands of city council. Uh, it's the department's job, however, to ensure that the residents uh, are equipped uh, with the facts and that um, the facts that they need to, to make an informed decision uh, with their community leaders. Uh, but that said, I, I wanna address uh, some of the repeated inaccuracies that uh, we've heard uh, from outspoken opponents, uh, namely uh, that the district will increase costs and, and create red tape and enforce expensive compliance uh, with the, with the uh, landmark standards. I think none of these claims are true. Uh, and for the typical owner, uh, we know that there is no, there are no special materials or products uh, that will be required for basic repairs on, on, on uh, landmark district properties. Uh, there are no costs for new windows and doors and, and tuck pointing and the, the roof repairs. They are exactly the same as any non-landmark district property. Uh, and additionally, um, there, there is no uh, kind of egregious review process to, uh, for improvements to uh, landmark property. Uh, the only repairs that require a building permit um, are generally reviewed by the staff. Typically, they are turned over in a matter of days uh, and only repairs to the building's facades um, are even subject uh, to the ordinance. I think, and lastly, um, there are no proactive requirements that property owners have to do uh, as a result of this ordinance. The Pilsen District uh, has been in place for nearly two years uh, and no owner has been forced to do anything or pay for anything uh, just because the ordinance uh, is in effect. So for the larger permit applications that involve demolitions and additions, yes, uh, there is additional scrutiny as there should be to address the trends, the market trends that we've discussed today. But for basic repairs, there's simply no increase in costs 
uh, no additional hurdles uh, to homeowners. So again, the district has been um, successfully mitigating neighborhood concerns for months now. Uh, without it, uh, the public resources to achieve those goals will ultimately be uh, limited. So um, there will also be uh, a second chance. Um, um, actually, there will be no second chance to revive the district um, if it doesn't move forward. So I would just like to thank you all for listening, uh, for commenting, uh, for engaging us uh, on this issue. Uh, and we look forward to the next meeting that we will hold uh, later this month. And so uh, thank you all and thank you uh, Norma for uh, facilitating uh, this session. My pleasure. Thank you, Commissioner. And this concludes our town hall for today. Again, we invite you to join us on the 27th of October at 4 p.m. Um, thank you for your comments and your thoughts. Um, and as a reminder, again, all questions that were unanswered uh, will be answered and be provided by the staff at a later time.